have a thinker in y'all's group. He is, he's planning to retire, okay. The, a, a lot of people do like the first, second, or the third of January because if you have lose or you, use or lose, I, I, I can't even say it because I ain't got it yet. <laughs> I had to take 10 weeks off with my second set of twins. <laughs> so uh, I'm almost there, though. I'm almost there. So if you have use or lose, and then you're still accruing leave, once you get to the new year, all that leave is now one lump sum paycheck. So you get paid out all that money in your... Now, the advantages to... The that is, it's paid in the new year. That's right. You got another thinker. They were like, taxes. <laughs> and so if you get retire on the 1st, 2nd, or 3rd, the 31st too, because guess what? Your annual leave is not paid until the new year. So it's not going to be on your taxes till the new year. Now, I have some people that don't care that they're going to lose their um, uh, their annuity will not start accruing until February 1st. They go ahead and retire at the end of the pay period, that first pay period in January, so they can accrue a little bit more leave. So that's a, your personal preference. And so we, we understand when we see retirements coming in, because I think the pay period this year ends like the 10th, January 10th, if I'm right. Um, and so we see a lot of retirements coming in for January 10th. Now, we'll still counsel them and say, you know, your retirement is not going to start accruing um, until February 1st by you picking January the 10th. They say, we, I know already, I just wanted to get the extra leave money. And that's fine if that's, if that's your game plan. So you have to work what game works for you. But the benefits to choosing January 1st, 2nd, or 3rd is just that. Uh, December 31st, too is between December 30th. If the 30th falls on a um, Friday, you can pick December 30th. So between December 30th, 31st, January 1st, 2nd, or 3rd, is that the lump sum annual leave is paid out in the new calendar year, new year, calendar year. And so you won't pay the taxes on it. It's going to be a lot lower because your income into retirement is a lot lower. Yes, ma'am. Did I answer your question, sir? Okay. That's pa paid out in your last paycheck. So DFAS tells us, especially if you have your retirement in way ahead of time and we processed it and sent it on to DFAS, they normally have that ready in your last paycheck. If they don't, they pay it to you the following pay period. It is taxed, like a third. But a lot of people like that because they know that they, they, their use or lose and all the, from the, the prior year that they've gained, it, it's, it's, it's good. Okay, good questions. Anything else about the best date to retire? Okay. Good questions. Um, so your annuity will accrue the first day of the following month if your retirement is effective after the third. So if you pick January 4th to retire, then your retirement won't be a f start accruing till February the 1st. And guess what? You get your retirement check six to eight weeks after that. So you won't get your first retirement check sometime till the middle or end of March if you choose any date other than the first or of whichever month. I was just using that month as an example. Okay? So you have to know what date that you retire is really going to be um, important so that way you will know when your first retirement check is going to come in. It starts accruing, accruing. You're not going to get your first retirement check. 
it's going to start accruing. You won't get your first retirement interim check six to eight weeks after you retire. And that interim check is not the full amount that was on your retirement estimate that we give out. It's only going to be um, about, a. Uh, they usually take about 20 to 30 percent out, OPM does, for your, any deductions you may have, health insurance, life insurance, taxes, things like that. They do withhold 20 to 30 percent from your retirement check, and that just keeps you from going into debt when you retire, because you don't want them to be sending you, you know, $2,000 a month, and then they didn't hold any of your health insurance, life insurance, and then you, for the next two months, you don't get a retirement check. So it's just kind of a, a safety for you. Okay. The VERA, the Voluntary Early Retirement. And for, to be eligible for this, you have to be at least 50 with 20 years of service, any age with 25 years of service, you must um, include five years of creditable civilian service. So if you have five years of civilian service and then you have 20 years of military, you can combine those because five of those years will be civilian service. Your agency must approve it. You can't just tell me, I want a Vera, let me go. I'm 50, I want to go home. <laughs> so that, yeah, you have to be approved from your agency. Now, for you all, it's a 2% reduction for every year you're under the age of 55. So if you take the VERA at age 50, there is a 2% penalty for every year you're under 55. So if you're 50 and you go out on the VERA, what percent, where's my math whizzes? How much percentage is that gonna be for you? If you're 50 and you leave, 10%. And it's forever. Have you seen the sound lot? It goes forever. Yeah. It's forever. It's permanent. Okay? <laughs> the discontinued service retirement, the DSR. If you're going out on a discontinued service retirement, there are some uh, eligibilities also, the 50 years with, um, you have to be at least 50 years old with 20 years of service, any age with 25, five of those years must be civilians, creditable civilian service. You have to receive written notice of, of the proposed involuntary separation from your agency or installation. So those are rare that they, those come around, but we do process those. For the discontinued service, now this is the only difference. If you're approved for a discontinued service, the, your retirement starts accruing the very next day. So if they say, you have to be off the rolls by the 17th, your retirement will start accruing on the 18th. And you also get the 2% penalty for every year you're under the age of 55, and it's forever. And you can't get the VSIP if you take the DSR. Okay, the deferred retirement. Now, deferred is if you leave the federal government before you reach your retirement, and you say, you know what, I want you to hold my money. I don't want you to refund it to me, just keep my money. Then at age 62, you would apply directly with OPM, and then you would be getting a check every month. And just send, your, send it in a couple months before you turn 62 so that you can start getting your ch checks on time, okay? Um, you have to have at least five years of creditable civilian service. You must meet the one out of two requirement at the date of separation, and it has, has um, not taken a refund of your retirement contribu contributions um, for your last pay period. So you can't say, um, I'm leaving the federal government, I want my money, I want my retirement money, and then apply for a deferred, you know, when you turn 62, because... That's like going to the bank. If you ain't putting the, if you took your money out the bank, you can't go back to the bank and say, I want my money. And that's how the federal government works for the deferred. So if you're going to retire on the deferred, you got to leave it in there. And then at 62, you can get it paid out. Yes, sir. Um, 
we had someone who wanted to go take care of her um, aging, aging parents. And they needed her there around the clock. So they said, she said, I just have to separate. Um, I don't want to pull my money out yet. And different situations in life come up, you know, with your children and your lifestyle. So it's a personal, it's a personal decision. Uh, for a deferred, your health insurance and your life insurance aren't reinstated when you, um, when you get start getting it, it won't be reinstated. So um, it's a big decision. You have to have everything lined up. Um, and you send that direct, directly to OPM. You don't send it to the Army Benefit Center. We don't process deferred. So those go directly to OPM. Okay. We have the disability retirements. Now, to qualify for a disability, you have to be unable to render useful and effective service because of a disability or injury um, expected to last at least one year. You must be in a position covered by CSRS. You must have a minimum of five years of creditable service. And your disability is taxed. Now, I don't know why people always think if I retire on a disability, I won't get taxed. But it is. It, you pay taxes on your disability for, from the federal government. Um, so I have a lot of people who will send me their disability paperwork, and I'm like, well, you're eligible for an optional. Well, I want a disability. Well, you're going to get the same amount. Okay, okay. And then, you know, disability is a lot of paperwork because you're going to have to get your doctors to sign off, that you need the medical documentation, you need your supervisor to sign sign all their forms and you need your agency, your CPAC to sign all their forms. And then he looks at me and goes, well, I'm not getting anything. I said, I, I told you it's the same as an optional because you're eligible for an optional. OPM is just going to pay you an optional retirement. So if you're eligible for an optional, even if you apply for a disability, you're only going to get the optional amount. Here's the, here's the forms that you will need if you decide to do a disability. It's all those ones on that other page that we talked about. You need all those forms that I told you you're going to need earlier, that, that page I told you to put notes on. And you need the application. That's something that this, you fill out yourself. The, the, I call it the 3112 series. The 3112A, the employee fills out. The 3112B, your supervisor fills out. 3112C, you're going to sign it saying, I give you permission to, I, well, not me, but OPM. You're going to give OPM permission to contact any of your doctors so that they can verify that you are disabled. And then this, the D is your agency saying that they have tried to accommodate you if they can. Okay? And you... If you are CSR, CSRS offset, you have to apply for uh, Social Security disability. And when you do that, just know the norm is you're going to be disapproved because they say, well, you still have a job. So the norm is you're disapproved, and then once you're approved from OPM, you apply back to Social Security. And usually that's how that dance works. And here's the formula on how um, the civilian service retirement system the, uh, is paid out to you. So it's 1.5% times your high three times the first five years of service, 1.75% times your high three times the next five years of service, and 2% times your high three times the remaining service over the uh, 10 years. And this includes unused sick leave. So if I was to show you an estimate, and I, I might have brought one where I could pull up, um, you're going to see where your sick leave is calculated into your total service credit. So what they do is convert sick leave over into your so that you're, you'll get paid out for however much sick leave you did not use. And not paid out like the lump sum for your annual leave, but it's added to your total service credit. Okay.
Unused sick leave. You must retire on an immediate annuity, is added to the length of service for computation purposes, and additional time computed is based on the 2087 um, hour work year. So on the next slide, we'll see how this is computed. So this is the big deal. I really sit down. Now, when I first went to college, it was for engineering. So numbers is, is, is good for me. But I, I don't go in depth with it because <laughs> I don't want to go there with you. But if you were, if you take sick leave and you're like, okay, I want to come, because when you, when we, I'll show you the total service credit in, on the next slide. When I show you that, the days fall off. And so a lot of times people try to work their total service credit where they're not going to miss any days falling off. But if you use one day of sick leave, it's equal to six hours. So if you work an eight-hour day, you've already taken two days of sick leave, really. So you, you have to go by the chart to, to, if you're going to compute out. Now, we can't do that for you at the Army Benefit Center. They don't allow us to. But if you can plan your retirement, you can see how many days am I going to have that are going to go over the years and months of service. Okay, I'm going to have 20 days. You know, so that's how you work it. But a lot of times it's not even worth it because by the time you do the calculation yourself, you don't put yourself in the hole and you're missing a whole month. Of, so we always tell people have some days because once it gets to OPM, they'll adjust everything and you, you might have shot in yourself in the foot and, and uh, cut yourself off from a month of annuity that you didn't have to. So this is the next chart is how we... Calculation. This is how we do the total service credit. So let's say that you chose December 31st as your retirement date of this year. And your retirement SCD, service computation date, was March 12th of 1983. You have a total, you've worked a total of 32 years, 9 months, and 19 days. If you have no sick leave, this is what I'm saying, that it's going to fall off the 19 days would fall off. So you would have 32 years, nine months that you're gonna get actually a check for, an annuity check for every, every month. So let's say that you have sick leave and you have 1,136 hours of unused sick leave. We add that to your total service credit so it, it converts into six months and 16 days. Once we convert it into years, months, and days, we add that to your total service credit, and you ended up with 32 years, 15 months, and 35 days. But because we only work on a 12-month calendar, 30-day calendar, we converted that. So you ended up with a whole nother year of add it to your service, basically. Another six months, 16 days. So basically, you're getting credit for 33 years, four months, and the five days is going to fall off. But 34 years, excuse me, 33 years, four months that you're going to get an annuity check for. Okay. Clear as mud? Okay. Everybody's shaking their head? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay, so the high three, they haven't changed it to the high five yet since I've been working there. When I used to stand at the copier, everybody used to be worried about the high five. It's still it's high three, so we're good for now. So for the high three. So what and they might before I retire. So <laughs> if they change it, then we'll have to go according to the law. Some people may be grandfathered in. Um, but others of us will just have to suffer. So, <laughs> but, um, so it's the weighted average of the highest three years of base pay, including locality pay and local market supplement. So, it's, so let's, some people call in and say, well, I was a GS-9 or I was a GS-11 back in, you know, 94. 
And I came back on board. I had, they had a break, and they come back, and now they're GS5 or 6. I was higher then. It's not on your grade. It's on your pay because you're making more now than you did back then. And then I have some people who um, I had one retirement that I did. The uh, gentleman worked overseas in Japan. And so he made more money in Japan, but then he was settling in the States when he want, was going to retire. So when he did that, he ended up making less. So I had to go off his highest three years, which was like two years prior to retiring. The norm is your last three years of working, you're making the most money. That's the norm. No. So it's your highest salary, not your highest grade. And she asked, does that cover overtime? That was her question. It's normally begin, the be, beginning date of the three-year period is determined by subtracting three years from the date of retirement. So that's, that's how we normally. So if you say I'm going to retire December 31st, we'll usually subtract three years and go three years back from that. And that's how we calculate your high three. Okay, so if you get an estimate from us, you're going to see reductions and you're going to see deductions. The reductions are if you take an early retirement for the VERA or the DSR. If you take, have any deposits or redeposits that you have not paid back, you're going to get a reduction for that in your estimate. If you elect for your spouse to have a survivor benefit annuity, there's going to be a reduction in for that. And the military deposit, there's, there's that catch 62 in there too. And we can, if you get an estimate and you're in that situation, it will spell it out for you. Under deductions... We do have health insurance, life insurance that you will see on the estimate, but you can go out on the ballpark calculator and look at your taxes. We don't do dental and vision in our office. They are contracted out. Um, the long-term care insurance and state taxes. So the only thing, the two deductions we we, care, we help you with is the health insurance and life insurance. But you're more than able to plug in the different amounts if you have anything else under deductions. Okay. So, your survivor election. If you are leaving your spouse, if you're married and you're leaving your spouse something, if you're leaving them the full survivor annuity, you don't have to fill out that other form I told you, that the spousal consent form. You don't have to fill out that. You just put it on the application. There's an initial box that says, I want to leave my survivor a full survivor annuity. You would just fill that out for them. If you want to leave your current spouse a partial, there's a box on the application for that, and that's what you're, you're going to need that um, notarized form for. Your former uh, spouse survivor annuity, if you want to leave them anything less, if you want to leave them the full, you can. And we've, we've had some people come through and do that. You want to leave a former spouse um, a full survivor annuity, you can do that. If you want to leave a former spouse a partial annuity, you can do that. <laughs> if you want to leave a combination to your former spouse and your current spouse. You know, I know you guys are laughing, but this happens. That's why I have to go over this. Because sometimes the former spouse has the children, and so you have to leave them something in order to cover the children. But... Um, but there's, there's so many different situations that come up with that. But you're able to leave a combination to your former and your current spouse. Um, or you can just say, I'm not leaving a survivor annuity for anybody. I'm going to get what I get while I'm still alive. 
and you can do a self only. And especially if you're not married, the self only one is what normal normally we see come through. There is the insurable interest annuity. Now, this is extremely expensive, and this is when people want to leave one of their loved ones, or it can be anyone. You can leave someone um, an annuity, but th it is very. You, they have to prove that they're in good health. They have to. There's a lot of things that go into that. So we rarely see. I think maybe since I've been working at the Army Benefit Center, I've seen two insurable interests come across my desk. So it's extremely rare. Calculating a partial survivor annuity. Take your monthly amount. Take the monthly amount of desired. So however much you're thinking your spouse is going to need, you take that and you divide it by 12. And then you, you excuse me, you multiply it by 12 because there's 12 months in a year. And then you divide it by 0.55 because that's the highest that you can leave them. So here's the example. You and your spouse agree that you want your spouse to receive $980 per month. The calculation follow. You take the $980 times 12, and that equals $11,760, divided by 0 0.55, so it's $21,000. Three hundred and eighty-one dollars and eighty-two cents. So you—that's the amount that you're going to write on that application. You got to write the yearly amount that you want them to have. A lot of times, people say, "What is the least I can leave them?" And that would be twenty-two dollars a year. That's what you would put in on that application if you wanted to leave them, and they will. <laughs> and the reason that I'm going to tell you the reason behind that is because it, it'll pay them out $1 a month and they're entitled to keep the health insurance because you have to have the, and the rules for health insurance is in order for your loved one to continue health insurance, they have to be getting a survivor annuity. And even if it's just $1, they're getting in a survivor annuity. So, and that would keep them getting their health insurance, okay? So just make sure that everything is well planned out if you're the one covering the health insurance so that they will at least, um, and now some people say, I know that the health insurance is going to cost them around, you know, $300 a month. So they do the math according to this formula, and I'm so glad that they added this slide there because I used to sit and do the math for every person that came to me. Um, but this, this formula, you can pretty much, it's, um, you can help yourself, okay? Say, okay, I need to leave my spouse this amount in order to cover this fee. Okay? So here's the formula on how they do that for the survivor benefit cost slash reduction. It cost, the cost equal to 2.5% of your base pay up to 3,600 plus 10% of your base pay over the 3,600. So in the examples, you see how they go through the cost and sh they show you the yearly reduction if you do um, the survivor annuity. 16,500 yearly. And then here's the other one for the base pay of 30,000 and they this one they're going to leave them they're going to put 1,980. The other slide was way better I thought because it gives you where you can say okay this is how much I'm planning to leave my spouse and you can just work the formula. Okay? But this shows you the cost on how much it's going to cost you. The survivor benefit is payable for life unless the survivor remarries before age 55. Benefits will be restored if the marriage, if the remarriage is terminated in death, annulment, or divorce. And a lot of times 
You don't. You wouldn't believe how. I mean, I do have a friend that would not get married until she turned fifty-five, and you know, she, her, her husband passed away when she was pretty young, and she was like, "Nope," because I'm getting his benefits, and so she just stayed single until, you know, she was fifty-five. So this this is a good question that a lot of people asked, and then if the if they get remarried, they can always just. Um, and the marriage doesn't last, they'll get to pick up your benefits again so that you can inform, ensure your loved one is well taken care of. Okay. So here are the beneficiary forms. Now this, I'm gonna get on my soapbox. <sighs> okay. The beneficiary forms are so important I'm not just saying that because I'm the um, death and disability counts, uh, team lead. Because you don't know how many people we see that come through our office, who, that employees that pass away, and they have not filled their beneficiary forms out since they started. And guess who they left everything to? They mama. Now, that's okay for my sons. They can do that. <laughs> but it's... I mean, they have children and they have families and they get nothing. And if they're not in good standing with, you know, their mother-in-law, they get nothing. So, or one case when I was, when I was actually a counselor, the ex-wife got everything and they were only married two years. And then the new wife that he was married for for 30 years got nothing, her and all the children. So... There are some horror stories if you don't fill out those beneficiary forms. I also advise you to refill them out every like three to five years because addresses change and people pass away that you do have on the beneficiary forms. So make sure you fill. I'm really putting a plug in for these, these forms because it really is a big deal. And to see people fighting at a funeral, it's, it's hard. It's hard. So... Make sure that you fill out the 1152, that's for your last paycheck, and any unused annual leave that you have. The 2823, now that's the big one. That's your life insurance. The 2808, that's for any money that you have in the CSRS, your retirement fund. And a lot of times you'll see on those beneficiary forms, pay to my spouse, and then they'll have the spouse name, you know, they have your spouse name, otherwise, and then they'll have a list of people. That ensures that their spouse is going to, you know, get the survivor annuity. But if my spouse is not alive to get the survivor annuity, I want Maisha to get it, okay? That's M-Y-E. Okay? And then um, the TSP. Now, we don't handle TSP in our office. That's done directly with TSP. But if you send it in to us with your retirement application, we will forward it to TSP because a lot of people just go ahead and because they're sending in all, everything. We have a box that goes to TSP every day. So you don't have to... Um, send it to, directly to TSP, but if you do, that's the right thing to do. Okay. Now, here's the order of precedence. If you don't have any beneficiary, or if you can't remember who is on your beneficiary form, go, go ahead and fill out a new one. But the order of precedence is any court orders that you have against you. That's who they're going to pay out first. Next is any uh, beneficiary forms that you have on file. So you see that supersedes everything under the court orders. So this is a good thing. Next, it's going to be if you don't have a court, any court orders or any beneficiaries, it's going to go to your widow or widower. If you don't have any of those above, it's going to go to your children and or the descendants of your children. If you don't have any of the above, it's going to go to your parents. None of the above is going to go to the executor of your estate. And none of the above is going to go to the next of kin. And I do have a horror story about that. So this man, he had never been married, and he passed away. 
He didn't have any children. His parents were already gone. They didn't know who was going to get his life insurance. His cousin, who he hadn't seen since he was six years old, shows up at the funeral. Guess who gets all that money? Yeah. So please fill out your beneficiary forms. I'm really putting a plug in there for the beneficiary forms, okay? Unless I'm your cousin. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Either way, it doesn't matter as long as you make sure that they are certified. She asked, who do you submit those beneficiary forms to? If you're going to retire and you're just sending them in with your retirement, we can certify them in our office and forward them on to OPM and DFAST. But if you want to make sure your loved ones have a copy of everything, what you want to do is get it certified in your HR office and then make a copy for your loved ones, make a copy to be filed in your EOPF, and send in to us the originals. Or your CPAC can most definitely um, send in the originals for you. But as long as we can see it at ABC in your EOPF, we're good. That's what, what we're going to go by. That's what we're going to send in. Now, there are times when someone has filled out a beneficiary form and they leave it with their spouse. Or they leave it with their children. And so their children was like, well, I got the beneficiary form. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, it's not certified by your CPAC. So guess what? It's divided between all your siblings. No, 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 no. I'm in charge of mom's estate. Yeah, and they've already done an assignment on the funeral. And so guess who guess who's going to pay for that funeral? That one child, unless the other siblings are nice to them and and share the life insurance. So Yep. And it's what it's what your wishes are and the address is correct. You don't have to send a beneficiary form in with your retirement. That is correct. Okay. Just make sure you have an updated one on file unless it's, the person is still living at the same address and it's fulfilling your wishes. Okay. Now, as my children are getting older, I'm kind of like, hmm, which one is going to take care of me? <laughs> so it's kind of hard to decide. Okay. Let me do a time check. Okay. So I'm going to go over the death part and then we'll take a little quick break, okay? Death in service. This is for people who are still active. And I know this is hard to talk about, but if you are um, an active employee and you pass away, you want to know how well your loved ones are going to be taken care of. In the event that you do pass away, make sure your spouse or your loved ones know your supervisor's name and number so that they may call them and, you know, to let them know that you have passed away. And um, then this, what your supervisor will do is they'll contact their HR, and the HR will then put... Now it's done electronically, so they send us something electronically to let us know that an employee has passed away. So as soon as a death comes in, it sends me a flag on my computer because I'm the supervisor. Once I see that, I give it out to one of my employees and I say, you need to work this death. They have 24 hours to contact this, the, your loved ones. Now, I don't make them call them the day that you passed away. So usually the HR will put it in the next day. But I don't, we don't do that. We don't call them the same day. It's just too much. It would be too much. So usually within 24 hours after receiving notice that our employee has passed away, we go ahead and call the families, call the loved ones, and go over the different benefits that they do have. Um, and, and we do know that it's extremely hard time for them. So, so a lot of times they're not processing what we're saying, but it's just a service that we do provide. Um, so we contact them, we'll talk to them, we'll let them know who's going to be their personal 
a specialist who's going to be handling their case and will also um, give them our direct line so they don't have to call the toll-free line. They, your loved one is going to be very well taken care of. They'll call in a counselor directly and talk to a counselor. And that counselor will be assigned to them throughout the whole process. Then um, once they contact us, we, like I said, we have 24 hours within to notify them. The, the spousal benefit, it's a monthly annuity payable if you were married at least nine months. The exception to the nine-month rule is the spouse is a parent of the child of that marriage or the death was an accidental. Uh, the spousal benefit is 55% of the annuity. Children's benefits are payable if your child is unmarried and under the age of 18 or under the age of 22 if they're a full-time student or if they were disabled before the, they turned 18. Children's benefits are the same if a death in service or the death of an annuity. The children get the same if, you're, if you pass away while you are active employee or whether you retire. Your children are taken care of. Okay. So this is how it's paid out. If you have up to three children, if a parent is living, um, the 2015 rate is $510 per month per child. If you have more than three children, the 1532 is divided by the number of children. If you have up to three children, if no parent is living, then that rate is 613 per child. And if it's um, more than three children, the 1,839 is divided by the three, uh, by the number of children there is. Okay. So I, I really, I really take good. Uh, you know, that's a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I really do want to make sure that your family members are taking care of you if you were happen to pass away while you're still an active employee. And it does happen because we do work cases every day. Um, but I sure would like to see you guys enjoy retirement and um, enjoy yourself. So stay strong and um, get those beneficiaries done so your wishes are in order. Now, um, I don't see Mr. Hunt. Do you see Mr. Hunt? It just so you think it'd be okay to take like a ten minute break? Break. Okay, we'll go. With, I made an executive decision. 